most exciting about this new phase of seasteading is now actual ocean industry professionals are taking the seasteading mission seriously and offering to help with our seastead classification initiative to get seasteads flagged. We already have marine engineers, a naval architect, a maritime lawyer who has worked with flagging registries, surveyors from classification societies, a maritime network engineer, a coastal civil engineer, a marine insurance broker, and an expert in offshore logistics and marine insurance modeling. They've all reached out to us to volunteer their expertise and guidance. And thank you donors who've contributed so far. Now that we have inspired at least 10 seasteading enterprises to spend their own money to build seasteads, it's urgent that our community build a legal and safe path for seasteads. Otherwise, those 10 seasteading projects will be stuck in territorial waters with no legal standing in international waters. So international law requires that every vessel be flagged. A flag for a vessel is kind of like a passport for a person. Vessels that aren't flagged can be boarded or confiscated by any other ship that comes across it and you have no protection. Any vessel not registered under an existing flag state is determined to be stateless and has no expectation of protection under international law. So until we get enough seasteads to change international law, we recommend that the pioneer seasteaders get maritime flags. So the good news for seasteaders is that maritime flags can allow vessels a considerable amount of autonomy within the existing legal framework on the sea. And as many of you know, ships and platforms are functionally self-governing as they're crossing the ocean and aren't subject to the port state until they come into port. And we want seasteads to never come into port. So flagging registries have a business interest in profiting from the 10 seasteading enterprises we've inspired. So far, we have spoken to flagging registries or politicians from 10 flagging states. And the people who speak to us have titles like head of business development. And Liberia, which isn't even on uh, this list, which is the second largest flagging registry after Panama, they heard about this opportunity and they reached out to us. And I don't know how they heard about it, but when I told about, when I told our contact in the Bahamas, he started arguing about why the Bahamas is better for seasteading than Liberia. He was angry. He was like, I know that guy. He's trying to take my business. And I was just sitting back saying, man, I wish all the seasteaders could see this because this is our holy grail, right? Private flagging registries competing to grant our seasteads de facto political autonomy. And we can make as many seasteads as we want. And if we can encourage lots of flagging registries to compete to provide appropriate rules for a variety of seasteading societies, we will have taken a huge stride towards fulfilling the seasteading mission. So the people don't even know how far we got in our discussions during the lockdowns. The Bahamas flagging registry spoke to us many, many times. They were very responsive to my emails. They wanted to be the first to make money flagging seasteads. We were excited, they were excited. They put us in touch with a well-established classification society who spoke to us and here's where things went south. They ended up sending us like hundreds of pages of fine print regulations and most of the regulations had to do with rules for drilling the seabed and extracting oil and explosions and instability and hurricane waves and oil spills and I was saying that's not what we're doing. We're just gonna build a floating house. You know, compliance is gonna cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. And even the Bahamas 
seemed surprised by this. Even he said, you know, I wouldn't mind buying one of these. You classification guys are making it impossible for us to do this exciting futuristic thing. Um, can't you just make a new vessel category? And they're like, yeah, we don't do that. And that's when I realized this is the spot where seasteading is stuck. The existing classification societies, and there's more than 50 of them, have no economic incentive to create appropriate rules for seasteads. If the oil and gas industry is their customers, why do they need to do any upfront work developing rules for seasteads? So after four years of investigating how seasteading is actually going to work on the reality of the sea, we concluded that the Seasteading Institute needs to comb through the rules for spar structures and platforms and similar structures that are already in use on the sea and derive the rules that would be appropriate for a permanent floating home or business on the sea. And then we need to either present those rules to a classification society for a potential partnership or and I think this is most likely, the Seasteading Institute will need to develop its own Seastead Classification Society. So I got, I gained a lot more confidence in this plan when experienced people with decades of experience in the ocean industry started reaching out to us saying, quote, as the preeminent global organization supporting the development of floating cities, the Seasteading Institute needs to create its own classification society to establish itself as the premier technical authority for certifying seasteads. I'm quoting directly from a letter sent to us by our lead volunteer in the classification society. So that means we need to develop a set of engineering standards to foster the growth and improve the scalability of seasteads that do not move under their own power and are intended to be moored at a fixed point for an extended period of time. This is a market no existing classification society is interested in. They can have their oil rigs and mega yachts. We're going to serve the market of seasteads. And when we develop our own classification society, we can remove the obsolete technical roadblocks for legal registration with flag states. And we can make it a hell of a lot cheaper. We understand you're not drilling for oil. We understand you're not going to float in the North Sea. We know a lot as a community about equatorial waters and coral crete and doing this affordably, we are the specialists in seasteads. We're already the foremost entity with institutional knowledge about how seasteads will work. And legal seasteading requires cooperation among three entities. So in order for a flagging registry to grant you a flag, they need two steps. One, they need a classification society to certify the seastead is safe. Two, they need a marine insurance company to provide insurance. Then a flagging registry will be inclined to approve a new category of vessel. And when that happens, seasteading is off and running. So what is a classification society? A classification society is essentially a group of engineers that review the construction of a ship and determine that it's seaworthy they are the inspectors of the sea. So a classification society is an independent, non-governmental organization that sets technical rules for the building of offshore structures. They sell quality insurance. So it's our responsibility to develop the engineering standards in consultation with a, negative, with a, with a naval architect. And then we review the designs to confirm they meet the standards. And then we'll send a naval architect to the construction site to ensure standards are being followed. And they periodically inspect the vessel to ensure that they meet the standards. 
So why would any seasteader pay us to pay a naval architect for certification? Well, you can't seastead legally without it. And nobody else wants to serve this market. So without certification from a trusted classification society, no insurer will provide maritime insurance, which means no respectable flag state will register your platform, which means nobody will invest, and only risk-taking pioneers will seastead at their own expense. And if somebody does something reckless and the press calls the seasteading institute, I want to be able to say, we did not certify that. And likewise, when one of our aquapreneurs on our list of 10 projects that we recommend tows their floating neighborhood out to sea, I want to be proud to have our certification certificate. I want them to be proud to have it. And I want to be able to confidently say, yes, they are certified, insured, and flagged by a respectable flagging registry. Bring your children to visit. Classification societies are not legally liable for the actual safety or seaworthiness of a vessel. They just confirm it was built to their standards. But they are liable in the marketplace. If we confirm a seastead is safe and people die, that's the end of seasteading in the marketplace of ocean services. All we have, just like any classification society, is our reputation for safety and rigor. That's all any classification society has. We want the industry to trust us. We want investors in seastead companies to trust us. And we want marine insurance companies to trust us. So becoming the first seasteading certification society in the world protects us from two existential threats to seasteading. One, rogue state actors and mavericks. The reason the Titan tragedy happened is that the entrepreneur ignored classification approval. And more specifically, he tried to do too many things at once. Every new innovation you introduce, you add to the number of things that can go wrong. And you never want to reinvent the wheel or the spar. So as with all technologies, a seastead has to be technologically adjacent to what already works. It also has to be legally adjacent to what's already approved by classification societies and flagged by flagging registries. So fortunately, a seastead is a thousand times easier to make than this thing. And seasteads are technologically and legally adjacent to many structures the industry knows how to make safe on the sea. So let's start with the small stuff and move on to the big stuff. So a well-designed spar is like a pillar nailed into the sea. They've been in use since the Ford administration. I call them sea pillars to convey to land folk how stable they are, but the ocean industry call them spars. And more than 50 years of knowledge has accumulated to make these. And that means Chad and Nadia's seastead was technologically adjacent to what already exists on the sea. And I like this example. This is six meters wide, the exact width of Chad and Nadia's seastead. And just like them, it's more than 12 miles off the coast of Italy. It's categorized as a buoy. And look, it's got solar panels. So suppose they get out sleeping bags and spend the night. Is it a seastead yet? Suppose they build a cabin on it. Now is it a threat to Italian sovereignty? There are hundreds of these things all over the oceans, and I consider them legally adjacent. And they're not only fixed point, they're unmanned. So what if you lash a whole bunch of them together? What's its legal standing? So this is what we want to downscale, according to our experienced ocean industry volunteers. 
That flotel on the left can house 500 workers who live on it for like three months at a time. They commute to work by bridge to that oil structure. It's a lot like a cruise ship. It has a gymnasium, a movie theater, and we want ours to be 1% of the size and 1% of 1% of the price and floating in calm equatorial seas permanently and designed for a maximum of 15 people. If we want to avoid most maritime regulations, we need to drop existing technology from 500 people to 15. 15 is the magic number where, according to Tom W. Bell's research paper, you avoid almost all conventions except for environmental ones, okay? Wind turbine, even more people in the industry have reached out to us than our active volunteers know. I spoke to a Dutch seasteader who builds, to, uh, he builds a variety of vessels in European boat yards. And he recommended we tender a request to the builders of offshore wind platforms. They already build spars, much, much bigger ones in much, much higher waves. And this boat builder believes that wind farm firms that already build spars could be subcontracted to take it through the whole process from building to certification to flagging to insurance for a price. And I ran this by yet another builder who I won't name, who used our Seastead images in his famous TED talk about floating cities without crediting us or mentioning us. And he thinks this is an excellent idea. And I don't know about the cost of this, but spars already support these giant wind tur turbines that float in the gigantic waves of the North Sea. And surface waves are caused by wind. So if you wanna capture wind energy, you have to be in the roughest waves. So spars already float in the worst waves in the world. So conceptually, Take the wind turbine off that spar. Put a house on it. Build it to a hundredth the size to certification standards for one one thousandth the cost. Flag, insure, and station in the Pacific on the equator. That seems like considerably less risk to me for insurance companies. And if they can build a sturdy spar in the North Sea with the highest waves in the world, we can build it in equatorial waters with the lowest waves in the world. So our job, should you choose to accept it, is to derive rules from these structures and creating a new legal category of vessel, a seastead. Cheap as a buoy, stable as a spar, as safe as a flotel, and is self-governing as a cruise ship. That's basically what Jobs and Wozniak did. They took a bunch of existing technologies and put them all together in one affordable mobile phone. They stopped thinking about giant corporations and started thinking about individuals. And seasteading is just not that hard. It's a lot easier than going to Mars, and it solves a lot more problems. And check out my Eight Great Moral Imperatives, a video series I made as a volunteer uh, if you want to know what problems I think it will solve. So, fundamentally, it all comes down to creating a market of governance to compete peacefully with the monopolies of governance those silly land folk won't stop arguing about. And here's what's exciting. The professional volunteers we've accrued over the last year, don't think we're crazy. In fact, some have been watching us for 10 years and they've only recently reached out to us because we want to develop a classification society with the goal of creating a new vessel type we're going to call a seastead. So it's time to join the ranks of the professionals. I want the Bahamas to be proud and excited to be the first to flag safe, prosperous, and the first safe, prosperous seastead. And then I want Panama to say, wait, we're the ones sponsoring seasteading. We have a better deal for you. We want to specialize in flagging seasteads for medical tourism. 
And then I want the Malta or Liberia to say, I spoke to you on the phone. I thought this was too risky, but now, wait a second. The Bahamas has flagged one? I have a consortium of businesses who want to create Disneyland on the sea. It's not far-fetched. This image was on the cover of a sci-fi magazine in the 1960s. Buckminster Fuller described how the technology would work around the same time. So floating cities were always imagined to be politically independent for more than 50 years, and the oil and gas industry is already doing it. Both of those things are floating in very rough ways, rough waves. And the workers who live on the thing on the left, they play pool, it's so stable. And the rig on the right is so stable, they send a drill all the way down to the deep sea to drill through rock for fossil fuels. And it's so far down they have to float. And it has to be so stable in high waves they don't blow this thing up in a fireball. And the regulations to protect people from everything that can go wrong with this are what the classification society sent us. So this is what we're competing with because we just want to do this. It's not that hard. Technologically, this is easy. You don't even need a big company. You just need an aquapreneur. But we need a new set of rules for this which no classification society is going to provide. So we have a team of volunteers tackling the safety requirements to adapt for seasteads, and they are a great group. They somehow make this sound fun, and I think it allows you to think through the details of how a seastead would work. So if you want to join us, this is what our team is doing. We're reviewing the, the existing classification rules for similar structures and cutting and pasting them into our rules. We can get rid of the rules that don't apply to seasteads. We can directly adopt any relevant rules that can apply unchanged to seasteads. And then with the help of our experienced ocean industry professionals, we can customize and rewrite other rules to specifically fit seasteading standards. And then we present our rules for in-depth review by a naval engineer who we hope will sign off on them, perhaps after a few iterations. And there are a lot of excellent naval engineers in India. A generous donor has offered to match all donations up to $50,000. And here's why. Although we rely heavily on volunteers and thank all of you, uh, we will need to hire expert consultants to ensure that our rules meet legal and safety standards. Um, and we expect the cost of finalizing these rules will be upwards of $200,000 just in the next year, uh, depending on how you look at it. And there'll be more in the years ahead. So support your Seasteading Institute by scanning this QR code and making a one-time donation which will be doubled or setting up a monthly recurring donation. We also accept donations in cryptocurrency, stock, or from donor-advised funds. And are you an artist? You can help us. Artists inspire people to create the future. Everything the builders build starts in the mind of a visionary. And AI has vastly expanded the power of imaginative uh, artists. Uh, Dan Jan, uh, Dan Jan uh, Chekhov Dmitriov made a lot of these images with AI. Katie Chown helped with suggesting images. Look at this. This is a variety of aquaculture, agriculture, and freshwater production. This could be OTEC. Um, this is like a luxury hotel integrated into the cruise industry. You can take your vacation on the seastead. A company town. I once gave a presentation at the Antigua Forum where experienced business people interrogate you about your idea. They sponsored my trip and they shot down all my business ideas, but then they went crazy for the idea of call centers. They loved that. Our website volunteer, Spencer Flagg, made this. This seems to incorporate several of the eight great moral imperatives. 
And this is the kind of beautiful thing that will get things, that'll get people thinking more than anything I can say. So a successful age of seasteading needs an impartial nonprofit certification authority in charge of fostering a safe movement to the seas. And just as with any vessel, if you want independence and protection from the, among the family of nations, it's always the same procedure. A third party certifies it as safe, an insurer ensures, and a flagging state flags. If you do all that, then I predict nobody is going to have a problem with your seastead. That blank space represents the plaque filled with future names of big donors to our flagging project. If you want to know the history of how governance improves over time, check out my talk at the Liberty in Our Lifetime conference sponsored by the Free Cities Foundation. I talk about pirates. It's a lot of fun. Three seasteading talks were featured at the conference, including real builders like Mason Leshnia and Chad Elwartowski. I'll see you on the first Seastead soon. Thank you for listening.